There's so many legends in this building today. Legendary. So today on Legendary I Lived It podcast, we have a very, very special guest, my son, Joe Jonas. Joe, welcome. Thank you. Hi, what's up? I am so excited to talk to you. I'm thrilled to be on this uh, this show. Thank you for having me. This is a very exciting, exciting to watch um, this come together from the, I guess the the, the sidelines and to be a part of it uh, and talk to you is always a good time. But I think there's a lot of things that we could speak on that probably no one's ever heard before um, and share more of our our friendship and lessons that I've learned along the way from you and other people and um, fun antidotes that I think we could both pass along. Whether it's just a funny story or interesting uh, topic, I think. Uh, thanks. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. Well, I, I, I'm thrilled. Uh, you, you are my son and I'm proud of you. That's uh, the, the preset is I'm proud of you. Uh, as I was preparing for this podcast, it's funny to go through as your dad and prepare for a podcast when I, I watched a lot of it. And that's kind of the point of this podcast is talking to people who lived legendary moments. And you have lived some legendary moments, but you're my son. And you're the one that I saw as a baby. You're the one that I sang to and talked to in the womb. And I've seen you on the bit, some of the biggest stages in the world. So it, it really is exciting. And I got a little emotional this morning thinking that, you know, you and I were going to be sharing. And I so wanted, as I shared with you, you to be one of the first things that we do with this because I am such a fan as well as your dad. I appreciate that. No, it's, um, it, it, it does get you emotional. Um, I was thinking about it as well, just to be part of this and speak to just the amazing journey. I mean, I, it'll be interesting how we, how we chop this thing together to share with everyone because there's so much we can speak to, but, um, yeah, I think, um, to your point on, uh, on the topic of what your show's obviously focused on, there's been some really special stages that I've, I've, I've shared with, uh, incredible artists and musicians and been in the room with some really interesting influential people and then just even with the brothers and with you and mom and experiencing life together and kind of pinch we've had a, many pinch me moments um and, and also things where you can look at it one certain way and it end up being the right pivot in your career that could help but it takes time to understand that and so yeah, yeah. anyway, um, it, that I'm just agreeing with you. There's a lot to, to touch on. <laughs> well, let's dive in. So uh, I want to go way back. Uh, as, as I shared with you, you know, we, I often say to people, <laughs> they were in my van before I was in their jet. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that's real. Yeah. And we traveled the nation, and we had a band out of the college, and it was a singing, sign language, and drama group. But we took our family with us, and I have a vivid memory of you uh, sitting on top of our strongbox. We literally, like, got paid on the road. And this was, this was a vehicle where the kids were kind of passed around. You'd never do that today. But you sat on top of the strongbox so you could see out – because you were so small, you were just getting to the point where you could sit up. So we had this little strong box. You sat on top of it with a headset, and you were just at the point where you were learning to talk and sing. And I remember, like it's just seared into my memory, you looking out of the window and going, na ya 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 Gaston, ya 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 Gaston. <laughs> so the first performance that I think you ever gave was for that traveling group sitting on that strong box singing Gaston from Beauty and the Beast. <laughs> I was the I was the protector of the money. You that were was my main goal. <laughs> well, you got to do that throughout your entire life. <laughs> hey, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, no, I, I vividly remember some of 
those those days when I was very young, obviously, but um, still to this day, like just Disney music has such a special place in my heart. And I think it's interesting, like, you know, you, when people ask, what kind of music did you grow up listening to? Obviously, there's so many incredible influences I think of that you passed along. I think about driving around in a minivan listening to the Beatles and Fleetwood Mac and Carole King. And I think as I got older, I, I realized that not everyone was as obsessed. Like I, I just assumed all kids listened to those artists growing <laughs> up. Like it, that was our norm, but there was this beautiful balance of also like incredible songs that came from Disney animated or Disney films, Disney studio films. So obviously what Peter Gabriel did to uh, Elton John, there are epic tunes that even to this day, I look back on and more on the musical theater side, sure. Like Beauty and the Beast, but it all like, it all had like a through line of of life and career and how musical theater was still how to, how to play in our, and I say our, but brothers of like how it had um, an effect on us in a positive way. And then, um, and then as you become an adult, you fall, or a parent, you fall more in love with the music again, you relive it. Right. And um, it's just interesting back then you, you don't even put two and two, you would never put two and two together, but um, I've I've met other like uh, friends of mine and I'll talk about like, Oh yeah. I mean, I just like, you know, growing up listening to the Beatles and like, what do you mean? Like, are you, are you six, <laughs> 60 years old listening to the Beatles? But um, it's just, that was our norm driving around being introduced to that uh, Bee Gees, especially as well, wow. introduced to those songs. Like it was like Coco Melon of today. <laughs> you know, that was our, that, that was our, our kids radio or Disney radio back then. That's so good that you would bring that out because that was actually intentional. I yeah. mean, it was my love, wow. and it was my love of music and the artists that I loved, but it was so clear to me that you guys were musical. Um, and so mm-hmm. it was important to your mom and to me that our table was a musical table. We sang at the table. Oh, yeah. And it, we, there was always beats happening, creativity, and there were many things that if you went into it, we couldn't help, but that was that was my passion, and that was a big part right. of my life. So... <clears throat> Any interest there, I wanted to make sure that you were exposed to what I considered to be great music. The Beatles. Well, thank, well, thank you, because <laughs> I think like when I uh, speak to other people at my age, and they're discovering, you know, th- in my thirties, let's call it when I was in my twenties, people discovering the Beatles or discovering Fleetwood Mac or. Uh, Jefferson Starship, ELO, ELO, they know the hits. Right. They know the top five songs on a streaming service, but to know the the, um, the odd ones of, of of these artists, it's really special, and um, it just makes it uh, uh, more um, more obvious how important it was growing up. And full circle back to you know, yes, sitting there singing Gaston over and over and over and over and over again, protecting the money. Um, <laughs> Yeah, on a on a bus. I mean, we really, we really grew up. You know, when people ask like, "Well, when did you start?" And I'm like, "Well, I guess I started when I was about 15 in the band." But that's not really the answer. The answer, would be yes, started when I was about. I was in diapers on a bus. That's right. With my parents on tour, you know. So it's um, that, that's that's actually it's always been around. And you were always, you know, you guys were on the videos, and you were in the van, and you were in front of the concert. Uh, folks that would attend. I mean, it was it was just a part of it, but it did. I remember another memory that comes to mind. We were in the car, and Britney Spears was on, and you were, you know, it was before your voice changed, and at that point, you had communicated with us, surprisingly, but you had communicated with us that you wanted to go into comedy, and you wanted to be a stand-up comedian, and were so ridiculously funny. It was unbelievable. <laughs> But you were singing along to Britney Spears, and I turned around and I said, Joe, you have a great voice. And you went, I know. (laughs) And I said, well, you should do this. And your response was, 
yeah, maybe, but I'll never be in a musical and I'll never be in an opera. Which is so funny. Like, why are, was I so specific on those two things? Like, why opera? Like, what did I have against opera? I mean, I think it was the unknown. Uh, yeah, yeah, but where did you end up? Your first Broadway show. Right. Full circle. I was on, yeah, I, I was, um, I'm still so grateful that it happened, but uh, I was in Baz Luhrmann's production of La Boheme on Broadway for about a year and a half. And I remember it was um, a really, int- yes, so to your point, very funny and and a bit of a defining moment for me in my life and career, um, being so, my my foot in the, in the ground saying, I'm not going to do this and then end up being a part of such a sh- incredible show. And I was talking about it the other night and the audition process and how insane it was. <laughs> Um, it was. I think the I think it was seven. Correct me if I'm wrong. Was it seven? Like about around seven auditions. Mm-hmm. We kept going back. We kept going back to the point so the where you were just like uh, an what? open call. Yep. Yeah, I remember the first audition was an open call. Got the call back, so it was like a few hundred kids. Third audition was all right, great. Now sing in Italian. <laughs> wrong <laughs> dad to teach Italian. you that. For, yeah. For those, yeah. For those <laughs> listening, um, we've got. Italian genes. We're, we don't speak Italian. We're not directly from Italy. At least you're not. Mm, <laughs> so, definitely. So then got through that audition somehow. Um, and then it was more focused. Okay, now can you sing with a, in this choir, a small intimate group of young singers together? And then this is over like six, seven months. It I was remember a long process. For, we would we would forget about the show because, and I think at that age we saw, and it's a lot for a young kid to take, but we learned quickly. Like if you don't get a call, don't call, don't call your agent looking for an answer because you don't probably doesn't, it's not going to be good if they have to reach out to the production company. So just let it go. And if it comes to you, it comes to you. That's a hard lesson to learn very hard lesson to learn and i think at a young age it's a lot a big pill to swallow yeah because and i think it, it's relatable in any setting i mean you're in high school and you want to make the football team and yeah they sometimes you can see your name on the, on the list outside of the gym or sometimes you're waiting for a phone call and that phone call never comes through so you're not going to call the coach and be like hey coach this is more embarrassing you know <laughs> right um so you just kind of let go and just move on now, luckily, we were kids, so we also had like fun things we can do. We didn't. Our life didn't depend on on going and being a musical theater just yet. Um, and life meaning income, and you 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 were wearing many hats as a uh, as a dad, a minister, a manager. Like so, not even manager at that point, but kind of manager because we had an agent, but you're still a parent. So right. you're going to look out for your kids and what is coming their way. And it's a full-time job driving back and forth into the city from New Jersey to uh, go into the audition process. Anyway, I'll wrap this up by saying, and the seventh audition defining moment for me was, um, I found really interesting. And they call and they say, all right. And now the seventh audition is roller skating. That's right. <laughs> and, I think it was either you or mom just like kind of laughed on the phone. Like, and you told me, and I'm like, this is a prank. Like they're pranking kids. <laughs> punked was a really popular show with Ashton Kutcher at the time. And I'm like, this must be some punked on young kids show now. Like what's going on? Right. And they're like, no, the auditions in three days, but can you roller skate? And another thing, another lesson you learn early on. And for any actors out there listening, obviously, I've roller skated before. Does that mean I'm a roller skater? No. But am I going to tell them that? No. no. So what am I going to say is like, absolutely, I can roller skate. We're going to do it. I made it to I made it to audition number seven. But luckily, and um, this is something that I think is incredible and funny. And what are the odds? Is that you 
were a competitive roller skater <laughs> in high school. <laughs> and you did disco yeah. themed roller skating nights and competitions. And just like the films with those of you who are listening have may, may or may have not seen, there's a couple really good ones out there. And, and in the 70s, very popular disco nights. Yeah. And you skate for hours and hours and hours doing the splits and doing tricks and skating backwards and finding a rhythm with the music. So what did we do? We went to a roller skating rink for two days straight. Mm -hmm. Morning to night, take a break for lunch and go back. And I mean, I had two left feet. By the time I left, I could balance on one foot. I could skate backwards. Mm -hmm. I could do like a few little tricks could jump and land and all this stuff. And I got the role. And I remember showing up at the audition and I, I was, I was so hyped. I mean, I think it's like the, the only comparison would be like, or the closest comparison would be when somebody shows up to a dance class or a sporting, uh, or an, uh, you know, audition to get into, to a team and you're watching the other people and you're like, you're checking them out and you're going, Oh, I've got this. I've got mm -hmm. this. And this is, this is mine. But going into that with confidence and then getting that role was really special. And that was the premium um, kids role for that. That yeah, ensemble. That was actually pretty intense. I mean, I, and I understand why they needed somebody to actually know how they, how to roller skate because they built a stage around the orchestra pit. So somebody could skate yeah. around the orchestra pit. And on the right side of you, so the left side is the orchestra pit, right side of you is the audience. So you're not falling into anything but people. Right. <laughs> or, or instruments. They had a net, but still, it's a crowd of a net with roller skating rink. Uh, it's just, it's roller skates is pretty intense. Uh, yeah. And, and to just put a button on that role, which I think was also a really special moment, um, about a year into the show, they were at risk of closing. This, this theater was about 1,600 seats, yeah. biggest theater on Broadway, really difficult to kind of pack out every night. Expensive, expensive show, 60-plus um, cast members. Yeah. And my voice was changing during that show. So that you reminded me earlier. My voice was changing, and I remember a special moment and a conversation we had, parent to son, but also just like a, a big risk you sat me down and said, look, they called, they know, you know, your voice is obviously changing and I couldn't naturally hit the same notes as I did when I got the role and they lowered the keys for me. But at some point they could just recast, they have to recast that right. age range. Right. And they were at risk of closing. So they said, look, we have six months that we are either going to have to close the doors or not. And your son is not hitting the same notes as he once was, but, it's either he can hang on and we can work on his voice here and you can work on your voice at home and make it work until that six month window. And if we have to close, we close and he made the whole show or we'll know in about three months if we can, if we're going to go further than six months and we're going to have to let him go. And, you know, it was such an amazing experience. And I said, we said together, like, it's fine. I want to stay. Yeah. I'd rather stay than let go of this dream. And it actually was so important because it helped me with my voice singing every day and finding where my, my voice would sit mm -hmm. in the future. I don't think if I had that repetition, it would have been as good. So anyway, surrounded by story there. <laughs> some of the best voices on the planet. Yeah. I mean, they went, Baz Lorman searched the globe for, mm -hmm. I think it was, six or yeah six vocalists three guys three three women who were the best of the best the best and, of the best um, uh to be in that company was just phenomenal i don't know if you remember we we hired a person who was a roller skating instructor for the first day i do remember this and he basically was teaching you how to go forward go backwards and do do a few of the things you mentioned on the second day, I took you back, and I said, Joe, I want you to look at look at everybody that's skating. Who do you think the best skater is? And you went, that person. And I said, no, and they were going fast. 
Then you went, that person, and they were doing all these turnarounds. I said, no. And then you did this person who jumped. I said, no. And he said, well, who, you said, who is it? And I went, that person there. And they were just casually gliding. Mm -hmm. And I said, that's the best person in the entire rink. And you said, how do you know? Because they're confident on their skates. It's just like a guitar player who holds the guitar. You know if you're a guitar player where their fingers land if they're a guitar player. You know by the position of the fingers on a piano. I'm telling you. And then that person broke out and broke into a spin and a twirl and a jump. Oh, yeah. By far the best. And I said, what we're going to work on today is looking cool on your skates. Exactly. Looking like you've done this before. <laughs> <laughs> Because that made that that's the difference. There would be everybody would be Definitely. going after that role. I wanted you to look confident and cool on your skates, and uh, it, it, and it worked. I tricked them. <laughs> no, you became you were great. I mean, no, I, it was good, and it it, it was. Um, I I knew leaving there, I was like, okay, if there's like a if there's going to be an eighth audition where I have to walk on a balance beam, I don't know if I'm going to make it, but I. At least I know I have this one, um, uh, and that was really special. What a great connection that you and I have and had in that moment to be able to work together and figure out how um, to achieve this thing. And It was, it was um, amazing, was, and Joe, you have just this wonderful heart. Um, it's always been there. Like w- when I was coaching you for soccer, uh, Nick was aggressive. And he was going to, like, kick the ball, like, right through somebody. I was coaching you, and at one point, you, like, handed it off to the other team. And this was after you scored a goal. And I said, Joe, that was really, like, sweet, but he's on the other team. And your response to me was, yes, but he had not touched the ball yet. Mm. And I was like, what an... I, I went home, I got emotional talking to your mom, like... This kid has a special heart. And one night, especially in La Boheme, you showed it to me because un- unknown and un- unaware for most people out there is that parents can't go backstage on Broadway shows. So we dropped the kids right, there's off. No, there's no green room. for. I mean, I don't know if it's changed now, but from when we were growing up on Broadway, it was... You drop the kids off just like if they were having a nine to five. <laughs> that that's it. And and it was nerve wracking for us. But we dropped of you off. Of course. And there was that one night where it was almost blizzard like conditions and nothing was. And open. for those listening, there is like a, a child wrangler who yes. looks after the kids who obviously all the parents are comfortable with and approve of, but um that that's it. It's like a babysitter it. essentially for these young kids. <laughs> yeah, unionized and all the rest, and 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 professionals and some wonderful people that were there in most cases. But I was outside waiting for you, and there was nowhere to go, and it was blizzard like conditions. So by the time you came out, I was borderline delirious, and my fingers were almost frozen. And you walked out and you said, "Hi, Dad," and I was like, "Uh." <laughs> and, you, and I remember, you, yeah, taking you. I said, "Look." Come with me right now. And you grabbed me and, and pulled me. Going to a buffet. That's right. <laughs> grab you and pulled you to a buffet across the street and put your hands under the lights. Yeah, no, in the food. Back. <laughs> in, you literally grabbed my hands, and I was I couldn't even talk. I was so cold. And we didn't have a lot of money. I mean, we had enough to, to get by. And you grabbed my hands and just shoved them into the chow mein. <laughs> Oh man! Well, I hope we um, I hope we bought the rest of the chow mein that day. I I I just was glad to make <laughs> it through that night because I I didn't I was delirious by the time you came out and it was one of those uh, well, there were, big heart moments. I mean, yeah. Well, obviously, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree because here you are, like I said earlier, multiple jobs, driving in and out of the city every day. And New York, yes, it's it's a it's one of the best cities in the world, but Come December or January, let's call it January. Yeah. And the the Christmas lights are gone. The, the trees are, are are on the curbs, and it's still freezing cold. It's so cold. <laughs> and you know, if you're going into the city, and I think at that time, you know, there wasn't a place like the Sola House or 
a members club. And even if there was one, we probably we couldn't have afforded afford it. it. <laughs> we couldn't afford it, and we didn't know anyone to like a who's who to get us in. And and in Times Square, there's really it, it's a revolving door uh, location. You you go in as somewhere, and they don't. Ex- you're not. There's no lingering you have to like go that's right what you got to do take a picture or or get out and and i would go in and some of those places i would go in and order a hot tea and just just put my hand and just just hold it but you couldn't stay you had to give the table up we're not a you couldn't go we weren't going to really nice restaurants and but there was a place that we became like familiar with i think the pian the uh, guy playing piano and some of like the the waiters there and waitresses um, and they let us hang out in like the lobby. And back then, it's just so funny. You know, I think you can give a child this beautiful toy, but they're playing with the bubble wrap, right? Right. And we would go to, I think it was the Marriott Hotel lobby. That's right. It was up on the eighth and floor. And they had this amazing view that I still to this day, I, I brought Sophie when we started dating. Like I brought her there because this is one of my favorite places. And it's like, there's nothing special about it, but the view is great. And it's a view of Times Square, but not to the point where it's so high up, you're not seeing anything. You're like still kind of a bird's yeah. eye view. And um, we would go there and it was the one place we could order hot drinks. when yep. we Because Nick was in, I was in a show that was probably an hour 20. He was in a show that's like two and a half hours. That's right. He was <laughs> in La so Boheme while had, you, he was yeah. in uh, Les Mis while Les you Mis. were in La Boheme yeah. and we were running right. back and forth. Exactly. Um, and so we would just wait for about an hour until he finished by like 1130 most yeah. nights and uh, then head back and get home by 1230 and yeah. be in school at eight or nine. <laughs> it's insane. Insane. But what a life memory. And you know, Definitely. it's crazy as, as I get older, some of my favorite memories and we'll get into that, but some of the memories that are of the career are not the memories that now affect me. When people say, what's your favorite memory of Joe? And I'll say, well, when he passed the ball off to the opposing team so the kid could touch the ball. Um, <laughs> it, 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 it's kind of crazy what happens as you get a little older and you know my kids are all superstars. But what really blesses me is hearing my granddaughter's voice and her recognizing my voice. I'm going to think about that all day. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I feel like um, it's it's still so nice. You know, I think I get asked a lot. So, so how? I think the funny thing that I get asked a lot is like, so how? What? Why are you guys so normal? Or like, why are you not crazy? And I'm sure there's times when you know I was a little crazy or not so normal. But um, you know, I think it has a lot to do with parenting a lot to do with the relationship that you encouraged us to have with each other Mm. and you also just let us be who we were as people and you know i think you didn't hold too much of a tight grip on us as well which i think is an important thing because some people feel a bit suffocated in families and and feel like they can't have their own life or go on that journey and no matter where we lived or have lived or living or um, career choices or even just back when, oh, you want to you wanna go to this city yet? Great. Like there was never like, yeah, um, you were holding us back. And it was, that's, I think, an important antidote as well. Well, uh, you know, I think I, I recently thanked you guys because you're part of our evolution. You know, it's... It, it, your mom said to me early on, we need to be students of our children. And that mm. has been quite a journey because you're all so different. And and you all have your areas that are, quite honestly, unique and special and genius. But Nick is motivated with certain things. You're motivated with others. Kevin is completely different. And Frankie, of course, is completely different. And you each have your own motivators and your own touch points. Uh, But with that in mind, P 
people ask me, like, what what was one of the craziest things? And I'm going to jump ahead now. You guys are superstars, and then we'll come back to some other things. But you're, you're superstars. And they'll ask me, like, was it ever a moment where it was uncomfortable? And if you remember, I sat you guys down and I said, typically at 18, 19 years old, you would leave to go to school, go off to college, or you would start your career. And yeah. our time with you full time would be over. And in our case, we were in the van with you than we were in the bus and other things. So we're with our kids a lot longer. What a gift that has been for us to be with our kids longer. But I also knew what a potential non-gift that might be to our kids who are growing up. So I sat you down and I said this, you're evolving and you're growing. And I don't know if you remember this conversation, but you're living in a glass house where your lives are exposed to the world. And so I'm offering this with a little bit of fear, but since your life are, ex are exposed and you may need somebody to talk to, I'm available, even if it's uncomfortable, you can talk to me. And that was tested, and I'm going to bring that instance up, but it was tested. Like, And I've said often, I was a normal and good kid. I was a church kid in North Carolina, but I, sure. I went, but I, your mom spoke at a women's event in the hometown, and the first thing I said when I got up, if I dated you, I am so, so sorry, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's a small town. I said to them, my kids have grown up on the covers of magazines, and they were chased down the road by paparazzi, and any relationship was public information, whether the perspective of it was true or not. And there was a blind item that would not go away. And this blind item was like that there was some sort of like sex tape or whatever. And it wouldn't go away, and everybody was like, no, 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 I'm not talking to him. I'm not going to bring it up. I'm not going to bring it up. And... They said, you have to call, and that tested that moment of, oh, my God, I'm the dad, and I have to make this uncomfortable call. So I called you. You were in South America. I called you, and I said, Joe, so there's this rumor, and I didn't even know how to even bring it up. I don't know who knows how to bring that up, and I said, so, Joe, um, sex tape? <laughs> and you had the best response of all time. You went, Oh my God, I don't even know what you're talking about, but this is already officially the best dad talk of all time. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I think I, I did see <laughs> that blurb and I remember just laughing, but everyone, of course, around me thought it was real, but I just kind of let them think back. I was like, this is ridiculous. So I remember when you called me and how uncomfortable you were. <laughs> to ask me these questions and I'm just smirking at the other on the other t side because I'm like when you know there's no truth to it you're just having fun with it and so I'm the smart I'm laughing I'm, I'm thinking uh, he's he's cringing having to ask me this because oh my god even, even though he can wear his manager hat and then balance that with dad hat right now dad is a uh, dad doesn't know what to say <laughs> I was you know first of all Anybody else would have been better for that call, but it came down to dad. And I will say about wearing the different hats, up until, you know, later when it was time for me to no longer serve in the manager position for you guys, for me it was one hat, and that was protect my kids. And so, but there are times when you don't need me protecting you, right? And that was when it was time for me to no longer be your manager's. Right. And, and, but, but I never looked at it as two hats. For me, it was protect my kids. And when it was time, as hard as that was to step back, I still had the dad hat on. And, and it was still the same. Yeah. Hat. That makes sense. And, and I think it's, it's um, amazing to look back on it now and think, you know, one of the most difficult conversations I ever had 
um, with you and saying, you know, I think I'd rather go, go our separate ways and, you know, have a manager and then have you as dad. Yeah. And I can see in your position, you're like, I am your dad. I am doing it already. <laughs> and I can, and it's not about money or anything like that. It's literally just like, I am protecting you and what I like, but I can see that now, you know, being a, uh, being a dad, I can understand uh, now, but I think um, also important time in our respective relationship to be able to say, and it took time to understand that, but by you like letting me fly, it only makes our French or actually like our bond as yeah. father, son stronger because we can just talk about stuff and right. it doesn't have to be work related. We can just talk about stuff and it's um, about life and love and friendship and family. And then, you know, we obviously, we, we still work together in some aspects, but it's like, you know, it's more celib- celebratory than anything. Yeah. And it's so outside of, and outside of management, you know, for those that don't know, um, our dad's restaurant, our dad and mom's restaurant, Nelly's, um, we're a part of. And so it's like really fun to really invest in your dream and be a part of it in a different aspect. So it's like, it's in the family, but it's not the family business, you know? That's right. And it it was a hard conversation, but it was needed on several fronts. It was, it was, I, I, I said to you, it's, it, it is a vivid memory, but I, I said to you, I can't go where you're going right now and be comfortable as dad and manager. Right. Right. And, and, and at, at that point in my career, I was doing solo music and um, it, was, it, was, it was the start of my solo music. And it was my young coming of age album that was very much in the out outside of the Disney comfort zone. And that's where I wanted, you know, and, I and the to dad really, comfort zone. Uh, yeah. And the dad comfort zone. I mean, it was a, their song speaking to drugs and sex and alcohol and partying and like stuff. The young people, not all young people, but <laughs> most young people are experiencing. And for you, it not that it was like, I mean, if we're talking about all of your favorite bands, they spoke, they spoke a lot about that, but uh, your son is probably not the one you're like at that point in your life and career or career. It's just a big leap of faith, but also you can probably be comfortable with it and be like, okay, cool. I'm willing to support this. And this is what you want to be as an artist. Cause that's how you've always been. But as the artist, you're like, I want to kind of let my wings spread and go on this journey by myself. Yeah. Because I want to be able to feel like I'm this adult that I can do this on my own. Um, and it's like a graduation in, in a way. It um, is. I think. And it's healthy. It is a, important. It's healthy. And it's, um, and I think every parent goes through that in their own version of it, whether they're more inclined to be like, get out of here. <laughs> or if they're just saying, this is going to be difficult, but I understand this is what you need. This is what I need. And, I'd rather keep a friendship and relationship and you can come to me about anything you want. And I'm here. And, That's what I think every same. parent hopes for that they can yeah. have a great relationship. And, um, I think a lot of parents really are short sighted. Uh, and some of them are trying to live their dreams through their kids. And, you know, I had my, Oh, heart. absolutely. I mean, I, you know, I, I speak to a lot of parents who, I get approached by a lot of young people that, uh, and what if it's being a mentor on, on TV shows, talent search shows or, or coach or whatever you want to call it. And the big thing I always ask or yeah, the big thing I always ask them like, so why do you want to do this? Mm. There's always two answers. There's two answers. Usually it's either it's like, a, it's either, because I want to be famous, which is, yeah, or it's because I wake up and it's the first thing I think about before breakfast. And it's the last thing I do 
That's as right. I hit my head, hit my head hits the pillow. And I wake up in the middle of the night and I write down an idea, whether you're a songwriter or not, or you're a singer or you're not. And it, it could be, and that means everything, you know, that's, it's not just music, but speak touching on music and entertainment. It's like, it's literally all your obsession. And I, and it's like, okay, then that's, that's the secret sauce that you need to even start this. And it sounds so, and, and then also, you know, depending on their age, it's like, you can kind of tell with meeting the parent too, who's, who's more into it, the parent or the kid. Um, and I, I think it was amazing that we, we got the, we went to the master class of music and learning how to write and record and play, play songs through living in your house. <laughs> and then on top of it, musical theater and going on a stage with people you're not familiar with. And um, so there was a, we did that all before we were like 15. <laughs> so, or it's, before it's I was amazing. 15. And it, so it's, I, but I think now my big thing is like, when I, when I speak to young people, because the world is so different now, uh, things move a lot faster. Yeah. I feel like it's important for, for households to move a little bit slower. That's just me. I'm not oh, saying it's for beautiful. everybody, but I'm no. That, I just think, that's beautiful. You know, when we grew up, we didn't have, we really didn't have social media. We didn't right. have. We, I think YouTube was just starting. Twitter was like MySpace. My, we had MySpace. Yeah, yeah, and that was a couple of years into our career. That's so right. We had each other. We had home. We had friends. We had a normalcy, and I think you can find that. But I think it's like you know. Social media is just so fast and it's exciting because we can find new artists really quickly. But I think it, it somewhat feels like people have to get age up quicker and it's good to be a kid. It's, so it's like, you know yeah. what, you want to, you want to do this, you you're love this and you're 15, give it two years. But these next two years, like practice, study, learn, go be in a musical production, musical theater production in your school or like, a you know, a, a program that's out there on in your neighborhood. There's a lot of things you can do in like practice and understand and learn because that like is such a good foundation to have like a safety net as a human being before you go and venture off into the universe of the entertainment industry, because you're a kid in a big in, in an adult world. And that's, that's right. And Without you and without mom and without the brothers, I don't know if I could have handled it mentally. Yeah. And so I think that that was like my only major piece of advice that I think after learning all of this, I'd say there's no rush. Just take your time and and be a kid, be a teenager. And if you love it, love it, you're going to love it just as much in a year or two years or five years. That's so good. <laughs> you're just going to know that much more. Well, uh, I have said to you that I so respect the way you approach your family. We were intentional. Uh, and, you know, I often think about the fact that, you know, there were specific choices we made that I know I see evidenced in you guys. But then there are some things that come out of all of you that I just go, wow, the wisdom that you have uh, is, is so inspiring watching you be intentional with my granddaughters is so encouraging and you take time and you focus that time and you make special things happen and that really is kind of a a testimony of your goodness uh and and also your prioritization of what really matters yeah, I think it, it's full circle comes back to that, the importance of a foundation, you know, I think, uh, and foundation meaning family and friends and like something outside of all of this, you know, it's like yeah. our families are getting bigger and growing and, you know, it's so important and beautiful. We don't get to spend all of our time together, but we a family group text goes a long way. A call goes a long yeah. way. Um, when you're in the same city, just get together. You know, yeah. it doesn't take that much. Um, 
oh check in because it's it's nonstop and so it's it's so easy and I think it's like really special you know to to have the, the relationships that we all have with each other now because it wasn't always like that you know th- there was bumps in the road but um to be all in our you know, at least the, the three older boys being their thirties. And Franklin, who I saw two days ago, like we're all very close. It, it's um, it, it's really wonderful. That's so good. Priorities. That's the main thing. Well, Joe, I'm gonna mm-hmm. I'm gonna just talk about a few things, like related sure. to the career, and then yeah. I'm gonna ask you some like rapid fire stuff. Love so, it. Yeah, sure. With this is as the context, Grammy nominated. American Music Awards, MTV Awards, Teen Choice, Kids Choice, etc. Sucker for the group debuted at number one. At that time, only Aerosmith as a band had had that opportunity to debut at number one, and then the Jonas Brothers. You, Joe, have had kind of a crazy chart phenomenon that sits with you. Only six, at the time Billboard wrote about it, only six artists have achieved what you've achieved and lived in this zone where they have made it to the top ten, to the top ten with different monikers or entities, meaning you've been to the top ten as Joe, you've been to the top ten as Jonas Brothers and DNCE, and also... Artist for Haiti, which was We Are the World. That's four times. Mm. Paul McCartney did it three times. Beatles, Wings, and Paul McCartney. Jimmy Page did it four times. Johnny Gill, Donny Osmond, and Paul Carrick. That's it. And only Jimmy Page of that group did it four times like you. So in that context... I also just totaled up just a rough view, just on Spotify, between you, DNCE, and Jonas Brothers. Over 5 billion streams. There are only 7.8 billion people on the planet. So you guys have – you've dropped the ball multiple times. You've you've been on the biggest stages in the world. So I'm going to go through a few questions that are in the context of – what I think, and coming up this year, which brought me literally to tears, Hollywood Walk of Fame. I, I know you're going to win Grammys, and I know all that. What I care about more is that you guys are great brothers. You love us. And when I went through cancer, your visit is one of the things I talk about most because I was that was when I was at the roughest point. So, Joe, your heart, your love, your care— uh, all of it. You flew like home from Japan to make sure I was okay. So, like all the love a dad was, can was, have. I was gonna wasn't gonna miss that for the world. So I'm gonna ask you a few questions. What was the moment or two that wowed you more than any other thing you've done throughout this career? What was the moment that literally stopped you in your tracks and you just went, "Holy cow! Like this <laughs> is special." There's a lot, but I'm, I'm just to name a, a few. We performed at the White House when President Obama uh, went into office. We played. Um, this was this. This was the second time we played uh, um, during his presidency, and I think it was like a month or two in, and it was to honor Paul McCartney. And um, some of his iconic songs. And me and the brothers were asked to perform. We played Baby, You Can Drive My Car. Yep. And I'll just never forget walking in a meet and greet line to say hi to President Obama and the First Lady and, and Paul. And I've met Paul once before then, but he's one of, he, arguably my favorite artist of, of all time. And so we're saying this is the first time meeting President Obama. So I'm meeting President Obama, meeting Michelle, First Lady, and then meeting Paul. <laughs> and I just kind of like look at Paul 
and like and I kind of like look quickly back at President Obama and, I, and I'm like just this whole thing's crazy <laughs> and I look back at Paul and Paul just looks at me and he goes it's pretty cool right <laughs> like yeah it's pretty cool and uh that was one of the moments like pinch me moments you know like yeah. what is happening and then like Elvis Costello when President Obama landed on the the lawn on a helicopter like Elvis Costello, I have a photo somewhere of him on his phone taking a picture of that being like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> it's just so great. Um, that was one moment. Yeah, that um, was amazing. I've had, uh, I, I think, as far as actual performing, um, I played a show recently with the brothers who never performed uh, in in Central Park and it was for uh, global citizen. Yeah. And it's just a, in the middle of the day, which makes it more special because it's just, you can see everybody and it's just a sea of people and thinking like, Oh, this is just, that's is nuts. Like what, what a special memory to have this point in our career. Like, Oh, um, so that's another one. Yeah. And I'll, I think, um, uh, Last but not least, you know, we got to perform um, with Stevie Wonder at the Grammys. And it wasn't actually the Grammys that was was the special part of this. I mean, that was special, but that wasn't, that was nerve wracking. You know, that was just like, you don't, you want to make sure you don't screw up. And the rehearsal was what, what, what was special. So we rehearsed the song. We performed Burning Up into Superstition. Right. And we rehearsed it like 400 times within the band. And the rehearsal started at like, let's call it eight. Mm-hmm. But we showed up at like, like rehearsal started at eight and we showed up at like 10 or 11. Or I mean, and Stevie showed up at 10 or 11. Right. Um, and um, when Stevie walked in, they asked Stevie, is it okay if we film this? And he was like, yeah, just give me a second. So he left again to go shave and get dressed up comes back another 30 40 minutes later and by the way he's not late we just were we were like we're in the presence of stevie wonder we'll stay here all night right whatever he um, wants we <laughs> yeah we showed up early so that we could rehearse the thing and we played the song once and um stevie kind of looked around like all right cool like we're done and kevin walked up to him and said uh, mr wonder i just wanted to ask is there anything you want to change or anything you didn't like and blah, blah, blah. And he goes, if it ain't broke why fix it Woo. and he said it like in the i'm not going to do my stevie impression just did it in the most i like beautiful way and with a smile on his face if it ain't bro- broke why fix it and which like oh. and then cut to for three hours later we just vibed and played yeah. stevie music jonas brothers music jam 10 minute jam sessions like yeah p- biggest pinch me moment um but little things that you carry along the way you know that 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 little quote i use so often and i think about when um i'm working on a song or I'm, if it's a it's in a in a scene of a film or tv show or if it's on stage it's like if it ain't broke why fix it don't overthink it don't overdo it that's so good I remember when he walked in and you guys were just jamming and he walked in and I was over, you know, against the wall. It was a rehearsal studio. And for those that don't know, you know, there's a, it's set up like the stage you'll be on. And he walks in and he just started swaying and you guys were just jamming and you were vocalizing and the band was playing and he was right by me and he just went, oh yeah, I know who you are. Mm-hmm. It's one of my favorite memories. That unbelievable musician and legend was seeing what I know. Is that you guys are so talented and so amazing. So so another question for you. I work with a lot of developing talent. And I love that. I loved it with you guys. I've loved it with the other artists that I've worked with. Uh Some that are well-known, many that are not. Uh, And I've had a crazy journey as a songwriter myself and 
you know, artist myself, et cetera. Uh, but I work with kids that are developing in this fast-paced world that you mentioned, and you live in it from a different perspective now. You've had viral moments, right? You had single ladies. Actually, with single ladies, I specifically remember the head of the record label saying, you've ruined your career forever. No one will ever take you seriously. The guy that was <laughs> running the label. And you, Joe, when we went to the label and it went uber viral, you understood what they didn't. You poked your head in and went, wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and it went super viral all over the world. Of course, people loved it and still talk about it. For, for In this world of viral moments, what advice would you give to these kids? Many of them that I work with or the Jonas Group works with now, and, and that is my sure. passion. I love helping people develop their talent and inspiring part of why we're doing this. What advice would you give to people in this viral-focused, TikTok-focused world? Yeah, I mean TikTok and Reels, you know, they're 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 the king and queens of yeah. of the entertainment industry right now uh, for for viral acts and viral moments and songs. My advice would be do your best not to chase trends too much because before you, it's always been this way, right? I mean, you, you hear songs you like and artists that come out that are so unique and different. And now, you know, when Tame Impala first dropped their music, everyone wanted to make a Tame Impala record. And by the time those songs were released, it was a thing of the past. Right. And it's the same thing with these viral moments. It's even quicker. So whether yeah. it's like a TikTok trend or if it's like a TikTok type song, um, taking a nursery, nursery rhyme and then putting curse words in it, which is sure. It, could, it might work, <laughs> but I think like, I feel like it's it's so easy to chase those trends and not be authentic as an artist. You got to find your thing and be confident with that. Take advice from the people around you. I mean, some of the best, one of the best things I've ever was told by was Nick Carter, of all people. Um, he stopped me as I was, we watched a Bachelor Boys show here in New York City. I think it was Irving Plaza or something. And on and his and Johnny Wright, his manager at the time, or their manager at the time, Bachelor Boys manager. I was talking like these are men, these are the guys I'm working with, blah blah. And he like stopped me and he was on his way out. And he said, Learn from the people that you respect the most and learn from their mistakes so that way you don't make the same ones. Yeah. Um, now obviously I think everybody's got to go on their own journey and make a few mistakes in their life and learn from them. But I thought that was really interesting. So I I think it's similar. It's like you don't wanna be a copycat. You wanna take advice. Mm -hmm. You wanna like obviously you know, I think there are fun things, dance challenges and things like that. That's like, it's good to hop on. And it's fun. But when it comes to actually like being your own artist, like find out what your vibe is and what your thing is. It can be influenced by other artists, influenced by other songs, but like, don't just be uh, a copy and paste, you know, find your, your own thing, be your own um, somebody, be your own viral, Oh, be your own virus. I <laughs> Yes, I love that. That's awesome. Joe, That I think if some of the developing artists of the world would just hear that, it's going to make a huge everybody that difference. People become these big, big acts. It's all something that no one's ever heard or seen before, and it's unique, and it's like, that's just so cool. They're so confident and unapologetic, and that's what they're about. And it's I'm not saying you have to be like, if, if it has to be like aggressive or crude all the time i'm sure like rude all the time like you can also be uh, if you're comfortable in your own skin you're a singer songwriter and you're you're wholesome that's fine too <laughs> but even that is like unapologetically you and like i think that's something that stands out that's awesome well the, the last thing that I want to do to be sensitive to your time. If you remember that Paul McCartney event and Jerry Seinfeld stood up and he started quoting in front of Paul McCartney and he said, what exactly did you mean? And he said to Paul McCartney, <laughs> the lyrics of his song, she was just 17 
you know what I mean. And he said, no, Paul, Sir Paul, what did you mean? <laughs> she was just 17. You know what I mean. So I have a couple lyrics from your songs that I would love to pull out and ask, what did you mean? Sure. From Hesitate. Time only heals if we work through this now. Well, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think um, I was stuck with the phrase, you know, like time heals all, which I, which I, I think to, uh, to a degree that that makes sense, you know, mm -hmm. for me personally, like I think, there are things in your life that you want to work through together sometimes in a relationship, or there are times when you or somebody else needs to, to put that time in, yeah. um, check in on their, themselves and their mental health and go through that process of whatever that, whatever that is. Um, and you got to start somewhere, you know, yeah. um, you got to stay ready so you don't have to get ready. And that's what I meant. You know, we can, Time is going to make it even better. But if we start fixing it, the problem, then we'll be good. Because by the, the next time we think about this, it'll be a thing of the past. That's so good. And I know mental health and protecting your mental health, you and Sophie both, um, has yeah. been such, I mean, such a priority. 100%. Yeah. And um, I think you know, it's hesitate. I wrote for Sophie and it's relatable I think for many people and in, in, in our walks with mental health and having a partner that can be there for you no matter what and the ups and the downs and the roller coasters of love and life and relationship and um but you know you got your person and it's like what are you ever you're going through today put it on me and, yeah. and we can work through this together you know it's powerful what did you mean from cool sitting there waiting like it's game of thrones <laughs> <laughs> um it's i don't know if it's misspelled online but it's winning like it's game of thrones awesome so not waiting but winning which makes it even better because um another nod to self i mean no spoilers here but she it, becomes queen of the north so yes. naturally i think she won <laughs> she did but i think also the game i of think Thrones, you won too yeah, you gotta be yeah, i did i think <laughs> um you have to think about when you're writing music how to make it relatable to everyone without sometimes knowing i mean you don't always have to obviously but like if you've never seen the show well game it's a game how do you what's, what do you want to do in a game you want to win so trying to just feel like you're Cool, obviously, is about self-confidence, the song, and feeling your best self and feeling invincible, feeling like James Dean, feeling like this person, blah, 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 like, feel, uh, feeling like Post Malone. You know, there's so many things that um, yeah. we, we nod to in that song, and that one was really funny because it was like a little Easter egg uh, uh, of a tune. Well, I remember, I, 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 wondering if you remember, I wrote you and I said, after you were hanging out with her and it was starting to pop up online, I said, Hey Joe, how you doing? And you were over in Europe and you said, have you seen the news? And my response was, are you the King of the North? <laughs> and I, and I probably wasn't even writing. Um, I was probably writing about real news. <laughs> Not even that. <laughs> so funny. And that's funny. Well, one last one. I, I still, in listening to Fast Life, go back to that project. And you were so far ahead of your time on that project. The producers all ended up, you know, the really special producers. Production was ahead of its time. Um, Thank you. 
And But there's a line, so what did you mean from all this time? I put it right in your face. Girl, it's yours. All you got to do is reach out and grab it. What exactly, Joe, are you talking about right there? <laughs> uh, um, you know, it's so funny. It's like sometimes you write these things from such a, um innocent place, and then you read them back, and you're like, that doesn't sound right. <laughs> um it was actually it's about your heart i know saying it's my heart is there to reach out and grab it but obviously um on paper it doesn't it doesn't read so poetic i think it is poetic and actually the song the entire record is a work of art uh, oh, i actually you. think and i actually believe that moment could become a big reels and tiktok moment actually not that it should <laughs> But yes, it's right here. Here's my heart. Reach out and grab it. But I thought, uh, I'll ask him because if you remember, <laughs> I after think it... that's a good good question. <laughs> I'm glad I can debunk some theories. But I don't know. You know, I mean, as I've learned from Cake by the Ocean, everyone will have their own interpretation of what that song means or songs mean. And yeah, we just kind of sometimes it's, sometimes it's just good for people to like have let let them decide. I mean, Kicked by the Ocean is literally about a, uh, mispronouncing a cocktail, sex on the beach. Right. And um, for many people, it can be sexual. Some, some people can be, I just like making cakes. Okay. Right. So I think. To each his there. own. Go for it. Well, Joe, speaking of that song and Sucker, you know, you have two of the best testing songs of all time. You have two songs there that are over a billion streams, far over a billion streams each. What a way to come out of the gate for DNC. Uh, and thank I, you. Yeah. It's, um, it's, uh, it's crazy to think about that, at that time and music and when we released it and, you know, it goes back to advice for artists, you know, just like, I, you just, it's so simple, but just, you can't listen to the haters, you know? And I remember posting online that song title for the new, and a little bit of a snippet of the new song. People are like, what the hell is this garbage? What, what is, what are you about? What is cake by the, what, what is this? And they're like, Oh no, flop city. And like, you just, you can't read the comments. You can't like, it's like, don't read reviews. So just don't do it. It doesn't help. And no matter if it's good or bad, you're going to be expecting. It's always going to be as good as the last thing that was positive that was written about you whatever it's just like i've taken a, a, i took a, a week of a birthday break week on of social media now it's been three months and i'm loving it and yeah. i'm not saying that also social media is bad that's not what I, that's not what I'm, I'm getting at for me personally it's been nice to just um be focused on the important stuff and everyone's their own critic you know I think like the other day we were walking out of an incredible movie and I was so blown away and I'm hearing people being like, I don't know, it was a little long to get to the point, like to get really get me emotional. I'm like, like, okay, who are you? Why are you? And obviously everybody gets to have an opinion about right. music and film and TV, but it's like sometimes to say it so proudly to people you don't know, it's the same thing behind a computer or iPhone and comment mean things and it, it could affect you. Or again, on the flip side, it's like, you see so many positive things and then you see one bad thing and you go, no. So it's just like, right. Fo focus on the real stuff, family, friends, life, real stories, real moments. And, um, like, and your artistry, if, if that's what you do, you know, when I was a pastor, there was this magazine that would come out and it was four pastors and it had this comic strip and that particular month's magazine it had a comic strip, and the pastor was in the back of the church, and everybody was coming by. Incredible sermon, pastor. That changed my life, and it was one after one, positive, 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 positive. The last person that came shook his hand and went, cute. And the next <laughs> frame is the pastor weeping. <laughs> and and that, that's for anybody that's in front of people putting their art out there. It just is so easy to have the one hater, the one condescending conversation or comment that that's the thing that you're left with and can be so difficult to overcome. 
but there's a lot more love. And look at that song. Look at Sucker. Look at your career. You know, I remember telling you guys early on, John Maxwell is one of these teachers on leadership, and he had a statement when we were going through one of those tough times, because un, uh, unknown to a lot of people listening, you guys have been shelved, dropped a couple times, overcome, you've done it on your own with labels, had labels disappear on you. Like, you've gone through so many things. John Maxwell says, if you can't beat them, not join them, if you can't beat them, outlast them. And look at where you guys have come. Oh, yeah, that's great. That's great advice. I think, um, you know, I, uh, I have some, there's so many moments and times that I kind of forget, you know, because we're still doing it and we're still, you know, our, our, we're focused and we as brothers doing this in our career. But um, there's been a lot of ama- amazing special times um, and want, want more of it, you know. I crave more. The last thing, because you have some big things coming up. What's around the corner for you and the guys? Sure. Uh, we've got some Vegas shows coming up. So I'll see you there. Yes. And um, I have a, a film that I'm a part of that releases on Thanksgiving called Devotion for Sony and um, with Black Label Media. It's, um, it's about a true story that definitely needs to be told um, about uh, two friends in the Korean war and their band of brothers that surrounds them. And um, I was lucky enough to write the end credit song as well. So I'm acting in it and I was, I wrote the song. um, So amazing. With Harv, Ryan Tedder and Khalid. And that's going to be released, I believe November 11th. And um, the film comes out Thanksgiving. Um, we're, we just announced me and the brothers are playing the halftime show for the Thanksgiving Day uh, Cowboys versus the um, the Amazing Giants. No, 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 Amazing Cowboys. <laughs> hey, look, they're both great teams, and it's going to be a really fun. <laughs> it's going to be a fun game to watch. I tell and, you, what's um, fun to watch is our little uh, text exchange rivalry. During, our rivalry yeah, during um, the game. No, both are amazing teams. And uh, it's going to be a blast. It's going to be um, so much yeah, fun. Yeah, so that's just to just to name a few things. Lots more to come, but um, busy season, but exciting. Um, and uh, I'm I'm really thrilled that you had me on. This has been a lot of fun, and nice to talk about some of these stories that sometimes I forget myself. So um, this has been great, and I'm I'm hopefully uh, you'll have me back. We'll do it again. I, absolutely, Joe. It, I, I'm honored. You're my son. You're an incredible husband, incredible father, incredible brother to your brothers and uncle. And on top of that, an incredible singer-songwriter and artist. Uh, but I'm, I couldn't be Thank more you. proud. As a dad, I couldn't be more proud of who you are and also of the life you live. So I love you so much. Thank you for being here. Love on. you. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Appreciate you, Dad. Love you. Talk love soon. you. Thank you. Bye. Well, thank you for listening to the legendary I Lived It podcast. It was great to have Joe on the show. I know you can now see what an amazing person he is, something I've known his entire life. It would be special for us if you would rate us and share with your friends. Talk to you next time.